So hello everyone, thank you for joining us to our talk, uh, Bring Your Own Bike to the Login Party. I'm Shandar Guba, uh, an engineering technical leader from Cisco, formerly uh, co-founder of Bonsai Cloud, and I have like more than five years experience with Kubernetes and the Fluent Logging ex Ecosystem. Please welcome my colleague, Adam as well. Hi, I'm Adam Budash. I'm also coming on five years of experience uh, with logging, and I'm also with Cisco as a software engineer. So for start, let's refresh our memories about Kubernetes logging. It's not too difficult because you can't configure anything. Uh, the container runtime writes the container standard output on the host file system, and the Kubelet service can read those files, and the user can access them uh, via the Kubelet, uh, Kubernetes API. And if you want to do anything more with your logs, you have to deploy some subsystem to, to handle these things. And logging operator is one of, uh, I think, the most uh, interesting tool to handle that. Under the hood, it uh, deploys a Fluent Bit daemon set, which uh, tails those files from your host, attach Kubernetes metadata, and send all the logs to uh, FluentD stateful set. In FluentD, we had a special plugin called the router which uh, makes you able to route uh, different kinds of logs based on the Kubernetes metadata. What it means is, is uh, if you have a label called, for example, app nginx, you will know that those logs will be nginx access logs, and you can configure your log uh, pipelines accordingly, so you can extract uh, metrics from them, parse those uh, files, and at the end of the line, you can send a wherever you want to do it. And I could go on and on for hours about logging operator, but it's, it's not a deep dive on that matter. I just want to highlight that it has a, a more than a thousand GitHub stars, a thriving community on Slack uh, with more than 500 uh, members. And if you are using Rancher uh, distribution of Kubernetes, under the hood, you are using a logging operator as well. And um, why I'm starting with this uh, out of uh, a VASP conference. So logging is hard. Uh, for example, log formats are so different that you can't even like count them. If you just check access logs like Nginx, Apache, AJ Proxy, they have all the same information but in different formats. Not to mention about custom applications that you are uh, operating uh, in different companies. They are like a whole lot of different formats. And there are routers, there are appliances, there are IoT. So it's hard to make a common sense of, of logs. And if you go one step further, uh, you not just want to uh, parse those logs and pass along the line. You want to extract value from it. You want to maybe uh, create metrics from an access log, or you want to unify, dif unify different uh, types of logs like HTTP or gRPC uh, success rates. And uh, if you prepared everything and everything works fine, there are still exceptions like Go Panic, Java exception. So there is another thing that you need to uh, be prepared. And if it's not enough, you have always something special in your infrastructure. There can be like uh, special time formats that you need to unify, or you want to inject a third party information into your log lines. For example, a typical example, when you want to have Kubernetes metadata on the log lines, you need to ask the Kubernetes API, get the information uh, attached to the uh, log lines. And uh, it's becoming a common practice as well to use AI to process your logs. So there are so many logs that it's, it is really hard to have a common rules, what's good, what's not good for your system. So AI is becoming uh, more and more important in this field as well. And uh, there can be any more. So next year, we may have like five different uh, items on that list as well. So just to summarize, what is the requirements of uh, such system? It needs to be performant. Uh, we are uh, doing uh, work on the data plane, and uh, there is a lot of data when we are talking about logs. It should be pluggable, because if it's not, you will have a big monolithic code base you have to manage a lot of third-party contributors. You need to watch for code clarity. The compile times could go uh, to the sky. And uh, with pluggable infrastructure, you can simplify the complexity of the code uh, by the, making it a configuration in, instead of code. And safety is also a really important part of logging. Remember, logging usually handles sensitive data as well. And uh, why I'm talking about logging, 
And now I will start to uh, talk about WASP. I think you know where I'm heading. So performance is crucial in WASP, and uh, the, one of the main pur purpose of WASP is real uh, native-like performance. It's pluggable. I don't need to describe that. We are talking about this all day. Safety, I think this is the maybe more important than performance itself. And we have prioritized how to use VASP as plugins. For example, in Envoy Proxy, you can use VASP plugins to filter or authenticate HTTP traffic. Uh, VASP is language independent, so you don't have to learn yet another language or configuration language, whatever, to uh, achieve what you want. And uh, a plus one that it runs in the browser as well. So we have a theoretical architecture of SAS system where you have the log source on the left side and uh, the logs are coming into the framework. It's a WASM runtime, and you have uh, everything in VASP plugins and transporting, routing, filtering all the way to the end. So from a complex system, we created a distributed complex system, which uh, doesn't sound uh, a really good thing to do, unless you have the tools to operate and uh, observe uh, what happens in your system. And we will concentrate on that part. Uh, we will introduce a tool that will uh, receive uh, log lines through WebSocket. You will have some sampling and uh, temporal storage to store those log lines. And uh, you can inject bus plugins into this uh, uh, system and uh, run through each lines that you want and check uh, which plugins uh, causes what output and what happens with them. Please. So let's take a, an overview of these plugins, how they work. I think you see some similarities with the previous talk. We have a receive method on the plugin, uh, which gets a length parameter. It allocates some memory, which is specific to the runtime slash language, how it does that. Uh, it calls back to the host to get the input data at the address that the memory was allocated at. Uh, the host copies the data there and the plugin then can process the input any way it sees fit, and it can call send methods back to the host, uh, passing the address and length of the data it wants to send to the next stage of the pipeline or as the uh, result of the pipeline. So demo time. Let's see this in action. So our basic interface in the browser is this. In the middle, you have an input field where I can input anything, press run, and you get the same thing. We don't have any pipeline yet. It's empty. So if I type something, run, it's the same thing. Now I'll activate auto run so we don't have to run press run all the time. So let's create a plugin. Here is a basic plugin written in Go. This is like the hello world of such plugins. Uh, in the receive method, it just checks if it got any data. If it did, then it allocates memory, calls get data from the host, it receives the data, and as you can see, it's a reverse plugin. It reverses the runes in the input data. And if I compile this, we're using TinyGo to compile the code. And I'll load it. We get nothing. There's an error in our code. Uh, if I get back to the slides real quick, I said that the plugin is free to call send anytime it wants. So as you can see in the code, we didn't call send. So if we do and recompile, reload, now we get our output that we wanted just the input reversed. While we're on the topic of calling send, we can do this zero, one, or more times. So let's try that out. 
I yeah, just wanted to mention that zero time is not an error as well, because sometimes you don't need a plugin to pass forward anything. We, we might want just to increase a counter or, or do something with a third party. Yeah, it's basically an unoptimized drop plugin. So if I reload, we now get, as we expected, the output two times. If I load the same plugin again, any guesses? We get it four times, but it's reverse reversed. So we get the same thing four times. Now something a bit more realistic. We also have an Nginx parser plugin, which is parsing Nginx logs. So as you can see, we have a few errors. This is because the code uh, wants to have a structured JSON message as input. So if I'll do that, now we get something. So as you can see, uh, the Nginx parser is parsing the message field of the log and extracting key value pairs such as the agent, the status code, or the remote and such things. Yeah, so it's really nice to have uh, uh, this kind of tool set. You have the text box, you can try out uh, each line of code you want, but it would be much better to grab those logs from a production or production-like system and go through them because we want to simulate the, the flows of a backend system in your browser. And uh, back in Cuba con Valencia, I had a talk about the log socket, which is a, um, a tool to tap in the production logs uh, of a Kubernetes cluster. So it integrates with logging operator, tap in the logs, and fortunately push out on a web socket. So now we have uh, this architecture. We have a Kubernetes cluster, we have logging operator installed, we have log socket installed, and we utilize a port forward to connect the cluster with this local machine. And we can now connect and tap into the logs of a Kubernetes cluster. On this cluster, we uh, run a log generator, which sole purpose is to uh, uh, generate randomized Nginx access logs. So get back to it. I'll just remove these reverse plugins because they are not doing any good. Uh, so to connect to a WebSocket, you need a URL. Let's generate that URL. Uh, and also I'd like to add, this is not specific to LockSocket, you can use any WebSocket URL here that is sending data, we'll use that as log data. So if I select any of these messages, the input updates and the auto run runs our pipeline on the log line. Yeah, so we have now production access logs. But what is the common property of access logs? They are boring, especially the status cause, they are just numbers. But fortunately, we had just the right plugin to make it a bit more fun. Uh, we wrote a plugin in assembly script, which will change the access code's numbers into emojis. So the 200s will be a smiling face, the 300s will be a pointing finger, the 400s will be a sad face, and the 500s will be a sick face. So let's try that out. So as you can see, uh, we have an input and we have uh, the plugin, uh, the parser plugin, and after that the emoji 5 plugin, and we have the status codes uh, changed. Uh, but one of the most uh, uh, benefits of WebAssembly is to have more languages. So this was written in uh, assembly uh, script, and uh, we have the, uh, another one written in uh, Go, I think. Yes. And it will help us change the boring agent long strings into a more fun emojified agent strings. And uh, as you can see, we changed the status code with the agent, uh, agent uh, text as well. And we can click through the plugins. So check at which uh, uh, plugin, what will be the output. So this is a, an important thing. If you are building a long pipeline and you have an error in the middle because you transferred something badly, you can just click through and, and get where the error happens. But why the, uh, stop the madness here? We have another Rust plugin that will change anything that is fine to emojis.
Yeah, so we have everything in place. So we created the boring access logs into good and modified access logs. And I know that this is not the most production ready thing to do. And I don't advise to run it in production, but you can get the idea where, where we are heading. So you can do and inspect every logs in your production. You can create your own web assembly plugins. You can try them out and you can build uh, this whole pipeline in your browser. And if you're done uh, with it in your browser, you can push these uh, plugins to whatever backend system that run around those trees. And if you don't like working in the UI because you are a uh, uh, CLI tool maniac, then you have an option to use our Logtail CLI tool as well and just grab those emojis from the access logs. Uh, so a few lessons we've learned while we were developing the tool and the plugins for it. Uh, there are still few languages that have full WASM support. There are many awesome languages that have some WASM support, but a few have the full support. Rust seemed to be the best option for us uh, as we were uh, trying to control the modules interface uh, quite strictly. Uh, maybe C, C++ has the same. Uh, with Golang, uh, we ran into some problems. Uh, for example, the built-in JSON package of Go uh, uses reflection by default, which is not really supported by TinyGo at the moment. So we couldn't use that. We had to use a third-party plugin. AssemblyScript, which is trying to mimic TypeScript and JavaScript, uh, is missing JSON and regex support. Uh, it needs also third-party libraries for this. Python, Ruby, JavaScript, and as I've heard, uh, C Sharp and the CLR has the, mostly the same thing. It, it has kind of an interpreter uh, which is compiled to WASM, and this uh, really restricts the exports and imports uh, of the module, uh, mainly to the interpreter's functions. So it's not really easy to export or import your code's functions. Uh, VASI support is uh, hit and miss. Uh, it, it's not available in the browser for obvious reasons. Uh, and different runtimes implement it differently. It's changing. Uh, VASI models without generated JS bindings, uh, which is uh, the default as we've experienced for most languages. It try, the compiler tries to generate these bindings. Uh, aren't trivial to create and use if you don't want these. And it's also hard to uh, add, uh, or no, to remove those extra imports and exports that are generated by the compiler for the bindings for WASI. And in Golang's example, uh, the main function can be left out easily. Yeah, so with this project, uh, our future plans, uh, other than implementing the backend system for it as well, uh, is like uh, adding monitoring information like memory usage and execute, uh, execution time to the plugins so you can uh, measure properly what input gives you uh, the best um, output. Uh, the configuration, so imagine if you want to build a production grade system from that, you want to have a VASM marketplace with plugins, with different configuration. So that should be included in this uh, testing UI as well. Uh, uh, creating stateful plugins uh, is a bit harder. Uh, for example, if you think about batching, deduping, uh, handling multi-line logs, you need to have some state in your VASM to, to process that. And uh, I think the lowest hanging fruit is stream processing in the browser. Uh, it's totally the same that we uh, introduced, just automatically grab the latest logs and uh, do the transformation on the pipeline. In the last slide, we have some useful links that uh, helped us to put together this uh, presentation, the logging operator, uh, which is the backend to grabbing the logs, the log socket, which provides the web socket output, uh, from uh, the logging operator flows. Uh, you have the whole demo uh, published on GitHub, so you can just um, access it and try it at home. Everything that you saw here is open source. And uh, there is the link for the KubeCon Valencia presentation as well, so you can get a bit more uh, understanding about how logging operator works. 
Yeah, so thank, thank you for your attention. Uh, any questions? If not, I have some. I, I loved your talk. I thought it was awesome. I'll go. Uh, so, you know, logs are the raw material that drive operations, intrusion detection, security monitoring, um, all sorts of downstream systems. Is there any particular direction you're heading with uh, with the technology? I would say that uh, as we were working with a lot of stuff and used a lot of tools to manage process logs, um, the way how VASP could fill in gaps with these plugins and performance system is, is a really good opportunity to make uh, one, one good tool for all. I I'm, think it sounds too good, but I have a feeling that in a couple of years that will be the reality. Enriching logs, you know, pluggable metadata. I mean, just over and over again. I, as somebody that grew up in the security community and dealt with logs at large scale, I wish I had this 20 years ago, that's for sure.